So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today I'm very happy to introduce Narcissus. He was an undergraduate student at the Federal University of Campina Grande and he received his PhD from USP. After that, he was a postdoc at Argonne National Laboratory. He is now the head of division for condensed matter and material science in the Brazilian Synchrotron Light Laboratory and in the Brazilian Center for Research in Energy and Materials. For, for his contributions, he received the Deo Sales Award and Serra Pileira grants. And the title of his talk today is X Rays on Condensed Matter Physics at Sirius, which is the new Brazilian Cicloton Light Source at Campinas. So thanks a lot, Narciso, for accepting our, inv our invitation. And please, the, the word is, is yours. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Thiago, for the invitation. I'll share my screen. Okay, uh, can you see it? Uh, yes, sir. yes. Okay, so, so, uh, so first of all, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to to, to talk to you guys. And uh, I'm although I've never visited you, but uh, uh, I, I heard uh, I heard several uh, times about your institute. And uh, and here, the, uh, perhaps uh, someday I will go there. Uh, and so here, what I want to show, uh, uh, that is actually a picture uh, of the entrance of the synchrotron, which is the, the, so far, the biggest scientific project uh, in, the, of the, in Brazil, uh, and was built, the serious synchrotron was built in the last uh, 10 years from the design for, after building, uh, making the building, and installing accelerator and beam light. So I'll uh, give an overview about that. As Tiago said, uh, I'm actually the, the head of the Condensed Modern Material Science Division here now. And, uh, and there is a lot of th uh, things that uh, we can do uh, to in the area. And this also correlated with a lot of uh, what people in the university do uh, in terms of experiments, uh, experiments here, experiments at the university, and also uh, a lot of theory as well to understand the, the, the experiments. So I'll just uh, give uh, a few notes about that as well. So for the synchrotron, we are here uh, at, uh, in Campinas, uh, close to Sao Paulo, and the synchrotron is actually uh, is not linked to the uh, University of Campinas, but is quite close. It's about uh, three kilometers away, and uh, we are uh, about uh, uh, I think it's two thousand or three thousand kilometers from from Natal. And uh, so that is actually the beauty uh, of the series. So we have several beam lines. So we'll talk about that. Uh, but uh, what can we take from that? From uh, why uh, do we do this here? Yeah. So uh, if we look at the the compare, so what we have here is uh, a, a source of light. But then if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum uh, and compare resolution and contrast uh, versus uh, at different wavelengths, you could see it uh, in the visible range. Uh, you is normally what we see uh, with our own eyes. Then if we go to radio waves, uh, it's a little uh, different. Radio uh, microwaves as well. Uh, and going to infrared, uh, we have different resolution and contrast. Actually, the resolution, it gets better and better when we go to shorter wavelengths. Uh, ultraviolet and half the x-rays, but I'm uh, in x-rays actually there is not only contrast but the penetration as well. Uh, what we uh, we we have at hospitals, for example. But at the synchrotron, what we cover is actually a uh, broad uh, range in the electromagnetic spectrum, 
uh, going even down to the microwaves up to the hard x-rays and all this the, the this range we have different techniques to try to understand matter uh, either the, with molecular vibrations or electronic transitions uh, or ionizations and uh, diff, uh, all these uh, phenomena give us different information the, uh, from the material that we study with this uh, uh, radiation and uh, from different techniques in different ranges. Uh, I'll uh, try to give just a few examples later about this uh, radiation matter interaction. Uh, perhaps we have seen uh, all this in, in the in the undergraduation or postgrad uh, uh, solid state uh, uh, courses as well. So for the synchrotron, uh, we we had an uh, old uh, machine that was I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, but it was in a building uh, uh, in our own campus in, in current campus. But then this was the land where we would build the serial synchrotron in. Uh, in 2014, and uh, and then the uh, after we had the design of the building and the accelerator, the, the, the construction started, and it went more or less okay, uh, although with uh, difficulties with cash flows and uh, delays and several other things. But then we made the building. Uh, this was by the end of uh, 2017, and it was more or less finished. The building was finished. Uh, by 2018 uh, and that is uh, one view of it uh, where i'm actually seated uh, i'm actually in uh, in an office right here in this window uh, and uh, but then for the commissioning of the so it's not only a building uh, we have uh, uh, these experimental facilities that is uh, that is also is not only the accelerator, but also these uh, experimental stations that we call beam lines. And uh, the commissioning of those, it looked more or less like that. So from December 19, we had the first beam on the accelerator, uh, a very, very weak beam. And we use it to, to take some images. Uh, there was a lockdown uh, during a period. But meanwhile, we are improving the current in the accelerator and uh, making available uh, all the beam lines. And then at October 21, actually we, we open, opened uh, several of our facilities uh, in beam lines and support labs to accept proposals from, uh, from users all around Brazil uh, to do commissioning experiments. So this is actually open now. And uh, that is uh, a little bit of a video of uh, what we have. Actually, we have a accelerator. So we have an electron gun uh, that uh, puts the, the beam, uh, the electron beam on this storage range. The first storage ring is a booster that were, where we, we, uh, we accumulate more electrons, more currents and more energy, and then uh, after this first uh, accelerator ring, we have uh, we put we ramp this electron beam to the main uh, storage ring, which is the synchron, the three GV low emitters machine. And then these electrons, uh, when they go through uh, and pass uh, close to bending magnets, they emit light and then this light is uh, it goes to these experimental stations where we call beam lines and we use this light that is produced by these uh, electrons going through the 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 magnets to study uh, materials so let's say that uh, the synchron is a source of photons and these photons are generated when electrons pass through uh, close uh, uh, by a magnetic field. And the theory of that is actually on the, the Jackson uh, book. In, uh, I don't remember in, uh, each chapter, but then there is a discussion about that, uh, preliminary discussion about that. So it's basically a relativistic machine. Uh, so, but then uh, 
some characteristics of our current symptom, what makes uh, the serious and good source uh, 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 um, a very uh, competitive machine is uh, one parameter, which is the emittance. And uh, actually the, the, this emittance, if we compare the, the, the old machine that we had, was uh, 100 nanometer radiance. Uh, the most machines, uh, uh, most synchrons around the whole world are uh, uh, better than that. But then at this fourth generation synchron sources, there are only three in the world, the MAX4 in Sweden, the ESRF, the European synchron in France, and us in the series over here. And this, uh, as this emittance, is basically a measure of how good we can focus uh, this uh, uh, X-rays, this, 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 either from from infrared to X-rays. If we focus to one point, but not only focus to one point so with a small spot, but also with low divergence. So it's basically comparing. Uh, if we compare a light, uh, uh, bulb light to a laser, and uh, we are more close to a laser in the in a coherent source than a conventional light. And this actually opens uh, several possibilities for coherent diffraction imaging that to have very, very high uh, nanometer resolution in uh, 3D imaging, uh, photon correlations, nanoprobes to look at material with nanometer resolution, in extreme conditions, which is the thing that I'm work more. So, but uh, let's say that from the experimental point of view, uh, what we get actually we uh, we get we want to have uh, a structural and electronic information of materials, but also with the spatial resolution from picometers uh, to to millimeters, and uh, if we put in that, and also the dynamical information from uh, picoseconds to seconds. And uh, put you on, on that scale, we have uh, different uh, experimental stations, which we call the, the, the beamlines, to cover uh, different things, either electronic, uh, structural, uh, and in different uh, spatial uh, range as well. So uh, here, actually, we are uh, we trying to focus our uh, our projects in, in in scientific agendas. We actually have three scientific divisions. Uh, one uh, which is condensed matter uh, and material science, which I, I'm the head of. Also, another the, uh, division for look at functional matter, uh, functional materials, and another division for living matter or biological materials. And depending on the beam line, depending on the beam line, uh, uh, they are they are more linked to to one uh, scientific uh, topic or the other. But then, actually, uh, there are several things that are mixed and can be done at in different uh, uh, stations. So uh, let's say that the, the ones that I want to give some examples here are the, the ones in my division, in the condensed matter, but there are other stuff as well. So uh, let's see if we can close this. Uh, so one uh, possibility, for example, for, uh, in, in terms of experiments are bricks, uh, resonant in X-ray scattering, uh, where uh, where we use X-rays, but uh, uh, not directly uh, as an spectroscopy in mind, but uh, we look at this momentum transfer, the difference between the scattered and incident photons, and uh, we can probe different phenomena from uh, molten isolator gap, uh, uh, DD uh, 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 transitions, magnons, phonons, and several other stuff. Uh, and uh, also putting some perturbation uh, like uh, temperature or, or, or electric uh, current or, and so on. Uh, so if we look at this energy transfer and momentum transfer, there are several things that we can probe, like uh, uh, having a fingerprinting of materials with uh, uh, 
uh, x-ray emission or looking at dispersion uh, or angular momentum or excitations. Uh, also correlated to that, perhaps uh, you, uh, you guys have heard as well, which is uh, ARPIS's angular result for the emission spectroscopy, where we can also use uh, uh, photo emission in the soft X-rays and resolve the, the momentum and look at the, the uh, uh, three-dimensional spectrum in, in the brillouin zone. So uh, those spaghettis that we get in DFT, for example, uh, with ARPIS, we actually can experimentally probe experimentally mesh. That is also a, a, another uh, a possibility, another uh, beamline that is, is not yet available, but that is that one was postponed a little bit. That is uh, uh, under installation now, but uh, should be available soon. Actually, the RPS station we have, but we just need to connect it to the synchron source. Uh, OK. And uh, actually, yeah, so this is a picture of uh, what we had inside the experimental hall, inside the building of the synchrotron. Uh, this was in 2018, uh, this picture. And then, uh, so uh, if you remember, so from 2014 to 2018, we had the construction of the building, the main building. But then from 2018 to 2021, we had more of the installations and, and commissioning uh, uh, of the beam lines. And that is more how it looks like in the, the, the same building uh, where we have several uh, beam lines around the ring. Uh, we have already six beam lines that are more or less available to users in this commissioning mode and several others on the installation and uh, initial commissioning. So. Uh, by the end of uh, next year, we should have 14 beam lines installed and, and, and hopefully available for users as well. Uh, and uh, today, yeah, several are operational, but then there are other beam lines that are under installation, like uh, this uh, uh, white square here on the floor is where uh, another beam line is, was installed. Okay, so, uh, but uh, what I want to show here at this uh, uh, seminar, this uh, colloquium, actually, uh, let's say that I wanted to give a, a little bit of overview of Sirius, which is, I hope, uh, something that I, uh, I showed you. Uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free. Uh, but also I want to show uh, a few other uh, possibilities with X-ray techniques and uh, changing the environment, the environment of the sample of what we can get. Uh, and uh, in, in also in, with uh, this will show more of experimental uh, possibilities, but also some correlations with uh, theory as well. And, uh, and later I'll ch show a little bit of on what we we are uh, doing with superconductivity, which was uh, uh, some examples, and that is more related to my Serpilera project. Uh, but then to start, uh, uh, one thing, yeah, so let's say that we want to combine synchron techniques with samples, but then samples is uh, not just measuring materials, but also we can subject those materials, this, uh, uh, those samples, uh, at different uh, thermodynamic conditions, either low, we, but why it, uh, uh, is this important? Is this present in nature? Actually, it is, uh, and very much close to us. Uh, for example, in the interior of Earth, we do have uh, high temperature uh, and high pressure, where, for example, the, the diamonds are, uh, are formed, uh, um, uh, between a transition of carbon to diamond right below the, the upper mantle, for example. Also, uh, Jupiter, uh, very extreme pressures and uh, there are all this stuff. Or even you can go to stars where we have uh, very, very extreme temperature and pressures where we have nuclear fusions and generation of X-rays and all this stuff. Or high magnet field in the universe as well. Uh, but uh, what we actually uh, do here 
is uh, not looking at all the planets, but we can subject uh, materials to the con conditions that are observed uh, in other planets as well as pressure, temperature, and magnet field. And what we do here is we use X-rays to look at atoms and electrons and see how those materials change at, uh, at those conditions. And for that, we use the synchrotron. Uh, but let's say that, uh, so I want to, so here is a, a, let's say a, a quiz in the middle. Uh, so we have two examples here, a neutron star and a proton. And uh, uh, so I just put here to, for you to guess uh, which of these uh, uh, entities, uh, physical entities, have uh, are the, the 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 biggest concentration of matter. So in, in the sense of what is the highest pressure uh, that we have, and the answer is uh, actually is the proton. Uh, so it's very close to us and in, inside the proton is in the universe. Actually, the, the, the highest pressure uh, that we can encounter, uh, not a neutron star and that is actually very, very extreme. But, uh, and that is because of the, the, it's not only the force and the matter, how much matter you put uh, together, but also the, the size. And the proton is quite small, right? Uh, and actually that, that is related to this hydrostatic equilibrium uh, between the pressure versus energy that you put in the gravity. And, uh, and that, uh, so I put this here to give you an example of uh, the, the pressure on the forces in the universe. But anyway, if we, let's say that we come back to Earth. And uh, so another quiz. Uh, so, Pressure is force over area, right? And then on those two, uh, so if we put a four-ton elephant on one foot or uh, a woman on one centimeter square heel, uh, what's the highest pressure? You might guess uh, is actually uh, the, the human shoes because uh, it's not only a question of force, but it's a question of area as well. And uh, that came to how we do experiments here. So uh, basically what we have, we uh, have a, a, a big uh, a big mass, like a big force or, or weight, like a airplane, like that, 500 ton on one centimeter square. But uh, unfortunately we, we couldn't afford and the, the airplane and to achieve those pressures and basically what we have are two diamonds. So we use these uh, two diamonds with a very small area on the range of micrometer uh, or, or uh, tens of micrometer area. And we apply a lot of force on the diamonds because diamond is very hot. And, uh, and actually those kind of pressures we can achieve in this way. And then we put a sample in the middle between the two diamonds and go with x-rays so we can do experiments and see what is happening to the sample and changing uh, the pressure on the system. And actually we can have different patterns of diamonds like those that we do at microscopy with electrons. So uh, we can reach very, very extreme uh, pressures close to the center of, uh, actually is pressures higher than the center of Earth. Uh, and uh, close to the, to the pressure uh, encountered in other planets as well. But uh, the idea is uh, the combination, the combination of temperature pressure field with the synchrotron techniques. And why do we need that? Uh, actually is to study different materials from quantum materials or condensed matter like magnetism, superconductivity, or carbon-based materials like diamond or graphite, or even surfaces and interfaces to look at with RPs, for example. So, uh, and if you go to other divisions, we can uh, look at biological uh, uh, catalysts and uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of subjects and a lot of types of materials. 
And uh, how we do that, uh, one example is, uh, for example, here, where we have uh, 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 looking at pressure, the, the pressure phase transitions. And we can look with X-ray diffraction, which is one technique that we use uh, to look at this, uh, how the, the, the volume, the unit cell volume changes with pressure. And then there are those uh, structural phase transi transitions that actually are related to electronic changes as well. Uh, like those ones, that's not, not structural. This is not structural, but that is more on electronic instabilities. And this is structure. And uh, also we can combine that with uh, spectroscopic techniques to look at not only the structure, the, the atomic structure, but also to look at uh, the electronic structure, like, uh, like in here, where we look at the valence, which is a measure of electronic oxidation, uh, uh, oxidation state material with the same pressure. And actually, uh, uh, if we look only by the structural information and try to guess what is the, the electronic uh, configuration of material, uh, we, depending on the theory, we will get it wrong. And is some from time to time it's good to, to directly measure the the information. And uh, in like this case where we 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 more or less prove that the, the bond valence theory uh, gets something wrong from time to time. Uh, but not only at phase transition, actually we can synthesize materials. At uh, uh, those conditions, for example, diamond. Diamond is one good example where, uh, if we go from so the, from these electronic potentials, uh, if we if we are in a well like that, uh, if we cross uh, to from the 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 minimum energy where the graphite phase is in, if we find a way to go to the other minimum of energy where a diamond uh, is trapped, we can make a transition between carbon to diamond. And actually th that is something that is possible, uh, experimentally possible, so we can synthesize diamonds uh, artificially. And this has been done for decades, but now that there are all the type of diamonds that also can be synthesized, like those uh, nanopolycrystalline diamonds, for example. Uh, we actually did, uh, we did uh, actually uh, diamondize uh, uh, graphite uh, uh, here using lasers as well. And that is one kind of thing that we can probe looking at this technique, this spectroscopic technique, where we can look the pipe uh, or sigma uh, bonds of carbon with uh, hard x-rays as well. Uh, and even uh, there are people that uh, showed that we can look this in 3D. So we have this 3D information of this spectroscopy data at each voxel, uh, not a pixel, but a 3D pixel, so it's a voxel, uh, and can look at these electron bonds as well. But uh, so that is for, for, we can look at carbon materials, but then let's say, what about the uh, magnetic materials? Actually that we can probe as well. If we look at this uh, X-ray magnetic circular diacrylism, where we excite uh, the core state, uh, the, the core level, like 1s, 2s, and promote those electrons to the continuum. But then when we have the circular polarization and apply magnetic field, there is this disbalance of the spin density of states. And this, uh, when we, we measure the spectroscopy, uh, the spectroscopy, the spectra, the X-ray spectra, uh, and we have a difference between this L3 and L2 edge, which is due to the spin of coupling. And we make a difference. We have this magnetic uh, uh, dichroism, which is proportional to uh, the magnetic uh, state, the magnetic moment of material, the net magnetic mo moment of material. But not only that, so with that, actually, we have element, we are selective to the element, the chemical elements. So like in a compound with five chemical elements, we can pinpoint the magnetism of one, only one of those. But not only that, we can even uh, look at, uh, for example, look at the dipole selection. And in this case, it was uh, XMCD with pressure. 
uh, when we changed the pressure, the, the shape of it was changing. And that actually was due to, to a change between the 5Ds to the 4Fs, uh, uh, electronic change between 5Ds and 4Fs. And uh, science, we saw uh, similar things. And this electronic change after we, we uh, we quantified that, and that was related to increasing uh, ordering temperature of material. So, uh, and uh, actually, then that was quite. Uh, I'm not showing here, but that was quite, uh, uh, quite agreed with um, initio simulations that we did on those materials. So, at the electronic propagation of the four, of the four S and five Ds. From our experiment, I agreed quite well with the simulation. So that is some combination that we can do as well. Uh, not only in the HRS, but also we can probe uh, actinide materials like uranium that we did as well to look at the hybridization between the 5Fs and 6Ds. It's a little more uh, tricky to, to do this experiment in the uranium because of uh, safety, uh, safety, considerations and how the things are more, uh, I'd say that the logistics are a little uh, more difficult, but uh, it's worth it as well. And we can look with uh, uh, spectroscopy data, uh, also quantum criticality, where we have a combination of uh, magnetism, superconductivity, and so on, and changing valence and, and so forth, that we also can look. Uh, with this X-ray spectroscopy uh, to look at the magnetic states on the high pressure or access quantum critical points. Uh, and not only changing the pressure, but also going uh, down a lot in temperature. Uh, we are about to receive a, a new system. That today we can go to more or less two or three Kelvin, but uh, in two or three months, in three months, we would be able to go to 0.5 Kelvin. Uh, so, but then, so I was saying that, uh, yeah, we do a lot of experiments, but what about a combination of those with theory? Uh, so if we look uh, what we have actually, uh, yeah, we do have the possibility of, uh, take, of having a lot of structural information from, from matter, from materials, uh, from X-ray diffraction, for example. Also, a lot of information from spectroscopic data, X-ray spectroscopy, uh, either magnetic or electronic uh, information, either in the hard X-rays or in the soft X-ray for the rigs, or uh, also RPs uh, for the band structure. So if we combine those, actually uh, this is very much related to what uh, 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 other people or we can do with uh, theory, for example, GFT or our initial calculation, where we, uh, we can use this structural information, this experimental structural information to do the calculation and estimate what is the band structure or the energy the density of states, the projected energy density of states. So this, with those information, actually we can correlate and, and uh, help to analyze or uh, corroborate uh, the, the, the data could, uh, can support the, the theoretical data or the theor or theory can support the experiments as well. So there are a combination of those, but not only that, um, another possibility is to use this uh, structural spectroscopy and DFT and uh, relate this with predictions, prediction of new phases. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, this, uh, uh, this compound for, was found uh, by ab initio calculations uh, with a, a genetic uh, uh, algorithm that uh, predicted that it would have superconductivity at uh, uh, 473 uh, Kelvin at uh, um, those pressures. And this is something that we can uh, simulate, we can, uh, let's say synthesize those materials that are predicted in theory, or we can have uh, uh, structural information and try to help this prediction to get uh, uh, faster to uh, discover new phase materials. Or, and also in the future, we might also include uh, machine learning systems to try to optimize either the, the 
structural uh, analysis or uh, also have uh, DFT correlated with that to uh, have prediction, predictions faster as well. Uh, so, uh, and then, so that is for some examples of techniques, but let's say that, that I also want to say a few words about uh, how we correlate that with superconductivity. Uh, and uh, for that, yeah, for, let's say that uh, for, probably you all know that, but let's uh, and just give an overview. So uh, we all know that uh, electrical resistivity, it, uh, so when we pass uh, electrons through a wire, uh, it emits heat, right? And uh, when you uh, uh, effect, and uh, that might be useful sometimes, but uh, in some sense, you are losing useful energy. You might use this uh, uh, heat by something, but most of the times you don't want to, to have that. Uh, and uh, actually, it, uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, this guy here, Owens, uh, he made the discovery after that he liquefied helium and then he put mercury and uh, he was measuring what is the resistivity of mercury at very low temperatures. And it was like that. But then when he went through uh, uh, below a certain temperature, about four, uh, I think it's four Kelvin or so, uh, he actually saw a drop uh, 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 very uh, uh, very quick drop of resistivity and that was it, the resistivity below that temperature was zero and that was what he called the, the uh, superconducting state uh, and uh, another property in this uh, superconducting state which is uh, this minor Meissner effect which is a uh, uh, in the superconducting state, uh, there is a, a portion of the, the magnetic field uh, lines that you could apply together to material. Uh, it repels the, the material from inside the, the superconducting material. And that, uh, for example, gives the, the, the property of uh, levitation uh, uh, of a superconductor, for example, if the superconductor is below the critical temperature. And from those two uh, properties of a superconductor, actually there is a lot of use of things, useful things that you can uh, take. For example, uh, if you have already uh, taken an MRI scan, so that is actually a superconducting magnet with at low resistance, at zero uh, resistance, or uh, there are uh, uh, magnet levitation uh, trains for transportation. That is one in Japan uh, that use this, the levitation of, of as a property to, to avoid the, the uh, to improve the efficiency, uh, losing less energy. And there are other uh, potential uses as well, like uh, lower loss in power transmission at long distance power transmission or even electric motors and generators uh, with uh, superconducting wires, for example. But then the problem is what limits all that is actually the low temperature. If we look at this, uh, uh, we, we have a problem that um, over the years, we increase uh, the order the temperature of superconducting materials quite a bit, but then it's still lacking. So it's still, uh, much lower than the temperature in the Antarctica, for example. But uh, so how can we solve that? Uh, yeah, I think Hollywood uh, already uh, solved that problem before. So they went to to Pandora and over there actually that they do have this uh, room temperature superconductor. Uh, that was the, the big mess that was in the Avatar movie and that made the, the floating, uh, the levitating mountains of Pandora. But uh, if we come back to Earth, uh, there are uh, another possibility that we can do, uh, more scientific uh, uh, option to, to, to take this problem. And that was uh, one thing that I proposed in the circulator project, 
which is one is how one goal is how can we have superconductivity at ambient temperature that is one goal of the project i proposed that and another is uh, can we uh, have can we validate some theories uh, on superconductivity superconductivity and uh, so if, uh, and actually, yeah, so uh, let's say for validating theory, uh, one thing uh, that we plan is uh, to, to use uh, magnetic flow diagrams to probe superconductivity and have a, a, a local atomic and electronic probe of, of the spin uh, of the electrons that are participating in the, this superconductivity. Uh, and uh, actually we did that we did already a uh, 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 proof of concept experiment uh, uh, in the old synchron. So we are about to, to, to do a new experiment here in two months from now. Uh, that was a proof of concept. So in this material, when we are at 10 Kelvin, so there is basically nothing within the error bar, but then when we go to two Kelvin below the, the superconducting state, it seems to have uh, a noisy, but, uh, uh, Two peaks here, here and here, uh, that this might be related to the this diacritism. Uh, we still have to confirm, and this would be related to the conductivity in the region. But not only to that, this high energy peak here would be more related to the hybridized electrons between the zirconium and the radium. So that, that we have to confirm. Uh, the difficulty of this is actually that the signal, this signal is about 100 times smaller than normally what we would measure for a magnetic material. So uh, nobody is uh, uh, actually prepared to do these experiments in the world. And we are trying to do the, the first, to try to probe this and open a new area uh, of studies of superconductivity to validate some theories. Uh, and that we hope that uh, with the flux and uh, high photon flux that we have at Sirius uh, and all the improvements, we can do this well. But what about, let's come back. So what about superconductivity at ambient temperature? Uh, one way to, so uh, our, the idea to, to go to that, it actually uh, came from Jupiter, uh, where there they do have high magnetic fields uh, that might suggest uh, high currents of, for example, uh, superconducting currents. And the planet is actually formed by 90% is made of hydrogen. And the planet is, uh, uh, because of the mass, is up to 4,000 GPA of pressure. So if, uh, and then uh, combining those high pressure uh, and hydrogen, some theories, uh, theories, uh, before have suggested that hydrogen would become a uh, superconducting material at ambient temperature. Uh, it was Neil Ashcroft uh, who passed away, uh, I think, one year ago, a couple of years ago. Uh, he was the first to 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 predict that, and uh, not long ago, actually, this is being more and more realized. Uh, like for example, this uh, H2S and lanthanum superhydride, where uh, the superconducting uh, temperature uh, is uh, about to, to, to cross the line of the ambient temperature uh, now. And that is uh, one area that we want to go in, but how we do that? Uh, so we have ideas, so we want to go to high temperature superconductors. The first thing that we, need for that is actually theory uh, where uh, there are a lot of uh, theory groups that are uh, proposing new phase of materials with ab initial calculations and combining different elements with uh, hydrogen for example and seeing which of those would uh, give them uh, the highest uh, uh, order in temperature superconducting temperature with uh, with uh, Abinitian calculations and some estimates and some approximations of, uh, of some equations, Mark Miller equations, uh, relating electron and uh, phonon coupling uh, to estimate the, the predict the, the superconducting temperature. Uh, 
but not only the theory. So after we have the theory and we know, ah, okay, so uh, let's guess that with those two or three chemical elements, you reach a temperature and then we have to put those elements in a pressure cell. Uh, but not only those, but we need to also put hydrogen together. So we, what we do here, we liquefy hydrogen and confine it in this uh, pressure cell between the two diamonds. Uh, and then we press it. Uh, so we press it, but not only press it, we press and heat uh, with a laser. Uh, so we put the sample there and with the hydrogen, with the diamonds, and then put a laser. And then we go to the extreme pressures and temperatures a little above uh, 1500 uh, gross, uh, Celsius degree. And, uh, and, uh, after that, in situ, uh, what we do, we do the X-ray uh, experiments. Both we can do both the uh, X-ray diffraction and X-ray spectroscopy, and see how is the structure and how the electron and the atomic structure and how the electron. Hopefully, how the electron structure of the material is behaving at that condition. And uh, so, after we do all that, uh, the the combination of those stuff. That is one thing that we did uh, recently uh, in our uh, new station here at Sirius. When we put the material uh, inside the diamonds, actually in this case was a, a cerium uh, hydride, uh, and we synthesized this cerium hydride here, this uh, high temperature superconductor. Uh, and but to do that is, uh, if we look uh, here on the right, actually that is a, a, a picture. Uh, of the sample in a microscope that is 38 micron wide. So it's, the sample is across a, a hole that is 38 microns. But then the, when you look with X-ray diffraction, uh, with this is X-ray diffraction, you analyze that at each point with a, a micrometer uh, resolution of the X-ray beam going all around the sample, uh, we actually it, uh, proved that, that the, this, the super hydride phase is not uniform, is not everywhere, but is more concentrated uh, at one spot here that is about uh, three to five microns, uh, right here, where we had the, the, the conditions in this uh, phase form was formed here. And that is one thing that we can use Sirius for to try to map and see what is going on, what are the phases that are possible uh, at these microscopic samples as well. So with that, I want to finish uh, just saying that, yeah, so let's say that Sirius is a star uh, over here. And uh, in the universe, we have a lot of uh, uh, pressure, temperature and magnetic field. and uh, everywhere, uh, including here on Earth. But then uh, the main message is that Sirius is actually an open facility, is a national lab uh, open to all the users, uh, all uh, scientists in Brazil and uh, from abroad, and uh, was meant to contribute with the scientific community, either uh, with experiments, either uh, trying to support and validate uh, uh, theoretical data as well. And let's say that success of Sirius uh, will come with the combination with the from the ideas uh, that uh, the users might have uh, to use here. So with that, I just want to thank you uh, for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Narciso, for the, the great talk. So I think now we we can open to, to questions. So, questions? Okay, we can begin with this. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, thank you, Narcisa, for a very nice talk. Uh, I uh, read about an experiment, uh, maybe it was done about two years ago. It, it, it is about uh, observing uh, a spin liquid state in a similar situation when you press, uh, I think, diamond or some material between two diamonds to 
screen, very high pressure. So how about uh, your your experiment? Are you close to these uh, conditions? Can you can you reproduce or uh, study this kind of properties, uh, such, such kind of yeah, states? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if this uh, was this a spin liquid in iridium compounds. Well, yeah, those uh, details I cannot. I think it was uh, Chicago University group that. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh huh. Yeah, I know the group. I actually worked with them uh, before when I was. I, I actually did my postdoc over there at Chicago, and uh, and yes, we can do that. Uh, actually, the conditions that we have here available are. Per, to go to much more extreme than that. Um, so let's say, uh, I don't remember exactly what was the pressure and temperature in that condition, but I think it was uh, 30 GPA or something. And here we can go one order of magnitude higher than that. And the temperature also can go lower. Uh, and to do exactly that experiment, in principle, we can do that. Uh, we, but let's say that uh, we might also do something different because we are friends with that, that guys. Uh, actually, there is a Brazilian there in that group as well. Uh, that uh, I actually made the, the bridge uh, to, to bring him there. Uh, but yes, um, that is some kind of experiment that we could in principle do it here. And actually, that was more or less uh, straightforward to do. So a related question. So how much uh, in this kind of experiment you would need uh, Sirius? So what, what, what's the role of Sirius in, in, in measuring or confirming the properties of the state? Uh, I mean, you, you, you do X-ray. So, so the, the part of creating high pressure is not Sirius itself, right? It, uh, with, with Sirius, with uh, X-rays, you just uh, do the, you study the properties of the state. If I understand correctly. Yes, yes, yes. So with Sirius, Sirius is a, a, a source of X-rays, and then we have in the meme lines there where we put the sample uh, at different conditions, and then we probe what is happening with the sample when we change the condition. And let's say that we can go from ambient uh, pressure to a high pressure, or ambient temperature to high temperature, or to low temperature, or apply magnetic field. And uh, that will do in situ. So that is actually what we call in situ experiment that we ch change the thermodynamic uh, parameter, the, the thermodynamic variable uh, in situ and see with uh, what is happening with the X-rays from series. Uh, to, and that is the combination of the synchrotron technique, either uh, fraction spectroscopy or imaging with changing the conditions of the sample. The conditions of the sample, you are right. So in principle, it could be done at a uh, university, uh, at the lab of a university and some uh, groups here in Brazil or in other institutions abroad do that. Uh, but let's say that that is something that we want to have the scientific uh, community in Brazil to grow. And uh, that capability of uh, having the pressure cells and diamonds and uh, low temperature and magnet field, that is something that we supply as well. So here at Sirius, we have the beam lines, but then uh, right next to the beam line, we have these support labs, uh, which in those support labs, we can uh, provide those conditions of high pressure cells, diamonds, prior start for low temperature and magnet field is already at the beam line. So it's a combination. Uh, say that the we have Sirius for putting the X-rays at these very pe uh, peculiar conditions of nanometer or micrometer focus with high flux, and have all the capabilities of doing for doing the experiments. But this, if we just do the experiment, uh, we'd have to put a lot of uh, uh, samples there and see if, uh, the uh, ambient condition. Uh, of the sample. We want to do more than that. We want to study those materials in conditions that are not only at ambient, but also uh, at uh, different uh, thermodynamic conditions as well. Okay, thank you. It is uh, apparently a very important uh, experiment and uh, uh, center for Brazilian science in the future. So I hope good luck uh, with, with, with it to you. Thank you.
that is a question uh, from Rodrigo. Hi, Narciso. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, I had a question about the hydrides. Uh, you mentioned a couple mm -hmm. of them, and the, the last one had serum in it. So as far as I mm -hmm. understand, the hydrides are supposed to be conventional VCS superconductors. So, so why cerium? Are you thinking about some some more exotic uh, like contributions from magnetism or something? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's a good question. Um, uh, anyway, nice to see you, Rodrigo. Perhaps one time we will see uh, in person. So for cerium, uh, actually, let's say it's a combination of uh, of motivations. Uh, Cedio uh, actually was seen that uh, it is a superconductor at not very high temperature, but uh, is, a, is an interesting uh, uh, problem that it might have uh, not only the BCS, like in the superhydrides, but my, uh, let's say that what I, I think is not sure yet if this is a pure uh, uh, BCS or if have some kind of heavy fermions or triplet or, or, or some other phenomena happening there. Uh, we, what we wanted with that actually was to, to synthesize because the conditions of synthesizing cesium hydride was, uh, uh, let's say, easier for us to do the first synthesis of a hydride over here. Uh, and, uh, and actually this, we could do it very well. And with, uh, in a, a very, uh, uh, Let's say um, a very controlled way, way much better than what the synchrons can do with this mapping and automatically finding where the, the phase is. But the second, let's say that the second step for that uh, actually would be to look at the electron structure of this synthesized material with uh, either uh, magnetic spectroscopy like XMCD or uh, even just uh, the the ISO spin spectroscopy exams to look at uh, the electronic density of state or the, the electronic occupation of cesium exams or even the valence of cesium, how it, this is changing uh, when it enters or, or goes out of the superconducting state. Uh, there are several other things that we are trying to, uh, to try to probe the superconducting state with uh, uh, this X ray spectroscopy. Um, in some sense, similar to what uh, more rotation can do. And uh, let's say that, uh, yeah, uh, we hope that the experiments work, but uh, for cesium, is a combination of, it was easier to do, but also it opens uh, a, a way uh, of opportunity to look with X-ray spectroscopy as well. And it might be that, uh, so, uh, Let's say that we do XMCD on this and then we see a strong magnetic signal in the superconducting state. So that would be great. And that is something that uh, we will we'll try to do uh, uh, in a little bit. I see, very nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I think, no, so let's, thank you. Okay, so one, one. Uh, just another question. Uh, in the spectroscopy experiments, uh, like Rick's, is it possible to measure or control the, the photon polarization, both the one that goes in and the one that comes out, so you'd have information from selection rules as well? Yes, yes. Um, yes, uh, and there are different techniques that we can do that. Uh, for example, for um, even for with single crystal, uh, with single crystal diffraction, we can do that with magnetic diffraction. We can uh, uh, probe, uh, uh, change the polarization of what is getting in, and uh, use polarization analyzers to look at what is getting out uh, with magnetic diffraction. But then when the the contrast is uh, both the electron and the magnetic, the contrast is slow in the diffraction mode. Uh, with X-ray, with XMCD, we basically do that. We change the polarization uh, 
uh, not going in. And then when the material is magnetized, we see what is this dark region is happening with the, the photons that go out. Uh, but not only that, with, uh, in the, that is in the hard X-rays. Uh, in the soft X-rays, uh, we also can change the polarization that goes in. And then uh, with uh, uh, the other techniques, we can see the, the, the how, what is happening with the excitations and uh, let's see. With ARPIS, uh, is at the current station for ARPIS is a little more difficult, but uh, maybe in the future. Um, but yes, in, to change the initial, the incident polar, uh, polarization of the incident photons, that is more or less straightforward uh, for us to do. Uh, to analyze the polarization after, depending on the range, we can do that as well. Um, but uh, depending on the technique, we do that uh, and that there are some user information that we can take from that. For example, that there are some proposed experiments to look at, directly look at the orbital angular momentum of materials with, uh, uh, with uh, synchronous te technique. And that actually requires uh, to have photons with uh, 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 changing the, the angular momentum of the photons in the source as well. So um, that is one possibility. We don't have it available yet here, but uh, in other places that is becoming more of a reality. Okay, thank you. the question let's thank Nasir again thank so, you thank you very much thank you very much Nasir. thank you everybody okay. so thank you Thiago thank you everybody so okay so next see you next week okay bye see you bye